Rescue Up Kids, J-Dog here, and today I'm going to take you on an exciting trip back into the past. Today we are going to go back and trace some of the most important developments that have happened in the history of science. The development of quantum mechanics and quantum theory. So hold on, here we go. First of all, the big question in the 1800s was, is light a wave or is light a particle? So scientists designed some pretty elaborate experiments to test light and see if it was a wave or a particle. One of those experiments was called the double slit experiment. So when you ask the question, is light a wave or a particle? The answer that you get is yes. Meaning, yeah, light is a wave and a particle. That's, that's not really the answer that scientists were expecting, but that's what we have found to be true. So in this diagram, notice that there are interference patterns forming behind the double slit experiment. So we're getting constructive and destructive interference. Maybe you remember for, from our discussion of electrons and the Bohr model that that happens with waves. So this experiment showed that light behaves as a wave. When the experiment is designed to test property particles of light, light behaves like a particle. So what we have decided and determined is that these experiments work a lot like the Schrodinger cat experiment. Remember in that experiment, the cat is alive and dead at the same time until you open the box and look inside. And that forces reality to choose one or the other option. Same thing happens with light. If you design an experiment to test it as a wave, it comes back as a wave. If you design an experiment to test light as a particle, yeah, it's a particle. So as the observer, you determine the outcome or the reality. And this was a crazy idea to scientists, but you know what? It's true. In 1924, a French prince named Louis de Broglier came up with a new radical idea, pretty important idea. And he said, well, matter, things like the electron, can have wave properties that we can mathematically describe. And not only that, but we can use the electron as a wave. And from his ideas came the idea of the electron microscope. That has turned out to be a very powerful tool. It allows us to use the really small wavelengths of the electron to magnify very small things like viruses much more so than what we can do with light. So we can look at things like the coronavirus with an electron microscope. The Curies, Marie and Pierre, worked with radioactivity. And Marie Curie was the first woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize. And they were able to isolate the radioactive element radium from a mineral called pitchblende. And that discovery had huge consequences later on. Things like nuclear weapons, the atomic bomb, and nuclear energy. And a lot of really good uses for radioactivity as well. Because radioactivity is used in medicine, it's used to sterilize surgical instruments, and it has a lot of really good uses too. An American scientist, Murray Gell-Mann, actually proposed in 1964 that protons and neutrons were made of even smaller particles called quarks. Well, that was completely theoretical because no one had seen quarks, but in 1969, the first quark was observed in a particle accelerator, and Murray Gell-Mann was awarded a Nobel Prize for that proposal. So quarks then make up protons and neutrons. Three quarks make a proton, and three different arrangements of quarks make a neutron. Quarks are held together 
by particles called gluons. And gluons interact by a force called the strong nuclear force. And that's a force like magnetism, like gravity, and other forces that we are familiar with. So gluons hold quarks together to make protons and neutrons. And this whole thing made scientists more excited about what they were doing and gave them confidence because they were able to predict things that no one had ever seen because of the understanding that we have of the world around us and then later on find those very things to be true. Werner Heisenberg was a German scientist and in 1927, he was awarded a Nobel Prize for making a pretty crazy proposal as well. It was known as the uncertainty principle. And basically, it tells us that the more we know about the position of a really small object like the electron, the less we know about where it's going to be in the future. So we can't make exact measurements of really small things. And scientists had a difficult time with this concept as well, because it meant that we had to think about th things more in terms of probability than the exactness of how fast they're going and exactly where they are and where they might be in the future. It also made the crazy prediction that electrons can actually bob ahead and back in time. They're not re restricted to an exact moment in time because of how small they are. Well, Werner Heisenberg also happened to be the director of Adolf Hitler's heavy water experiments to develop an atomic bomb. So there was a period of time when he was a very feared man because he could have allowed the Germans to win World War II. So, you know, he has kind of a sinister look. So maybe we should give him a mustache. Erwin Schrödinger was an Austrian physicist who was also awarded a Nobel Prize in 1926 for treating the electron pretty much as a wave. And some pretty useful ideas come out of his work. This is a mathematical function, it's called psi, and psi gives us information about the electron's position. If we square psi and take the absolute value, then we end up with the probability of finding the electron at any one place around the nucleus. From these quantum values that Schrodinger was working with, he came up with different orbital shapes that are probability zones around the nucleus that the electrons are able to occupy. And all of his work came from his use of wave equations. The most useful result of Schrodinger's wave equations are probably the orbital shapes that are probability zones where the electron can be found around the nucleus. The first is the s orbital, then the p orbital, the d orbital, and finally the f orbital. So Schrodinger developed four quantum numbers, n, l, m, and s, that give the probability of finding the electron at a certain place around the nucleus. And that has been a very powerful idea because it allows us to determine energies and other properties about electrons that describe how electrons interact with the nucleus. So now we think of the electron oftentimes as a standing wave moving around the nucleus and its energy can change, its energy state, as it interacts with things like light. We've already talked a little bit about Max Planck and the work that he did with light. Albert Einstein was doing similar kinds of things. And from the work of Max Planck and Albert Einstein, we were able to start thinking of the, of the photon as a particle of light.
Wolfgang Pauli was another German scientist who came up with the Pauli exclusion principle. And the Pauli exclusion principle makes use of the work that Schrodinger did, and it tells us that the quantum numbers of the electron are like an address for the electron. And therefore, no two electrons can have the exact same four quantum numbers because that would put them in the same place at the same time with the same energy, and that's just not possible. Frederick Hund came up with what we call Hund's rule, and what Hund's rule tells us is that electrons will half fill orbitals before they start pairing up with each other. And that will make a little more sense later on. So from a lot of these really crazy ideas that came out of quantum research, we now know that time travel might be possible, at least time travel into the future, because time travel depends on velocity. When you're moving at really high speeds, Time passes differently for you than for others. So, high-speed aircraft can change the passage of time a little bit. We also know that gravity is a field and that it can be warped and changed um, just like other aspects of our environment. And from that, we get the idea of black holes and possibly wormholes that fold space back on itself and maybe someday will allow us to travel great distances in very short periods of time. We also think that maybe the universe exists because of things called strings or super strings and that every particle is a variation of a small vibrating string in space. And that opens up the possibility of other dimensions that we've never observed. So there could be entire parts of existence that we don't even know about. So since every particle is the result of a string vibrating at a certain frequency and with a certain energy, we can think of the universe and existence as being like a symphony. So string theory is an exciting theory that gives us a lot of information and brings a lot of other ideas together that really aren't compatible with each other using classical physics. And who knows, it may end up being true. And if that's the case, then things like the many worlds hypothesis could be true. And the many worlds hypothesis projects that the universe could be branching and that every possible thing that can happen and could exist actually does. And that there are an infinite number of paths that are determined whenever there are choices or options for different outcomes in the universe. So, the universe could be pretty crazy, exciting place. And someday, hopefully, we'll be able to answer many of these questions. Right.